I'm standing on top of Victoria Peak, a major tourist site here in Hong Kong. Looking at all these skyscrapers, it is hard to believe that less than a century ago, almost none of this was here. And yet today, Hong Kong is one of the economic powerhouses of the world. For such a small territory, everything is big in Hong Kong. From their skyscrapers to the conference centers and their GDP. It is one of the most productive territories in the world. Highways carry traffic under the sea from island to island. Life moves at such a pace that skyscrapers have been demolished within a month of completion just because the property market has shifted. What makes Hong Kong's rate of productivity even more remarkable is that it has almost no natural resources of its own and everything has to be imported. It is clear for Hong Kong to have achieved this in such a short space of time, the citizens had to have not only a good grasp of economics, but also of science and technology. One of the ways this has been achieved is through a dramatic change in the way science and technology is taught in the territory. The Museum of Science in Hong Kong is a vast fire floor structure covering nearly 25,000 square meters. For anyone wishing to learn about science and technology, it's a wonderland. Each of its more than 2,000 exhibits are interactive. Interactive science centers are the opposites of conventional classrooms or hands-off approach museums. They are fun, exciting, colorful, noisy. They are places where the public can interact with innovative displays to learn about scientific principles. Science centers are based on a concept that was developed in San Francisco and Canada in the 1960s. It was so successful, there are now more than 400 science centers in the Northern Hemisphere. This section here deals with electric current. What they have to do is to find a broken filament. Looking through the magnifying glass, it should be easy to do that. And uh, it happens to be this filament here. The displays in Hong Kong's Museum of Science are made all over the world. This one that teaches electricity comes from France. By pulling in the cable, the children can drag themselves all the way back to the power station to see how electricity is delivered to the consumer. What better way to learn the effects of centrifugal force than to become part of the experiment yourself? There are displays on sound and the refraction of light. Reproduction and contraception are also dealt with. Different sections of the museum cater for just about every need. To teach people how to recycle in a home, this section deals with all that. If you want to know about the material that can be recycled indefinitely, you turn the can around and it is glass. The material that takes up most of the space in our rubbish dumps, it is paper. To learn about Earth's distant past, the old and new are combined in ways that children can relate to. And to teach people how a motor car engine works, what better way than to have a model that you can play with? The displays are designed to illustrate scientific principles as simply as possible. More complicated concepts are dealt with in the demonstration theater, where regular talks are given on a variety of subjects. But one of the most popular exhibits is the incubator where children can watch the process of life beginning. The curator of the Hong Kong Museum of Science is Xing Yu Yang. He told me that since opening 10 years ago, five million people have passed through its doors. We hope to arouse the curiosity. I think uh, arousing the curiosity so that they will have a lifelong interest into science. In South Africa, on the other hand, one of the most worrying aspects in our education system is our weak culture of science and technology. In classrooms, the resources are limited. Many teachers do not even have the skills to teach the subjects. And to add to the problem, only a small percentage of South African children grow up with technology around them. Many do not even have access to a telephone.
In today's fast-changing world, a good understanding of science and technology is essential for the development of any nation. Sadly, our own education system is in crisis. Thousands of schools around South Africa do not even have basic educational materials. Everyone knows something needs to be done and needs to be done fast. Local telephone company MTN, along with a number of other corporate donors, decided to do something about the situation and build a science center here in South Africa. The center has been designed to launch South Africans into the 21st century through an exciting and interactive way of teaching science. 5050 was invited to cover the project from start to finish. The location chosen for the Science Center was a massive Century City development on the N1 just outside Cape Town. This location was deemed ideal because it's designed to be a multi-purpose venue. Professor Mike Bruton, one of South Africa's leading scientists, is the man in charge. We've developed something which is based on a successful formula from abroad, but has a real African spin to it and is relevant to our needs here in South Africa. With no example in South Africa to follow, the Science Center had to be designed completely from scratch. The massive expanse of floor space also had to be filled with exhibits. Mike's search for the Science Center's African identity led him to Hout Bay to the studio of architect and film model builder Jan Korove. Here, the challenge of converting scientific principles into fun began. A glass tube on a pedestal is a basis for a Descartes diver. Yeah. The rubber acts as a diaphragm yeah, to, to, to change the water pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's Descartes diving. It will show how changes in water pressure can affect the buoyancy of a diver. A hundred-year-old sewing machine will become the basis for a food power generator. A Cape Town model building company was commissioned to provide sets for the science center. From giant blocks of polystyrene, models are being cut. A molding from the bark of a real tree provides the covering for an imitation one. A giant camera will send pictures of visitors to the center over the internet. But with so much space to fill, Mike had to cast his net feather field to find exhibits. South Island, New Zealand, on the far side of the globe, is a tranquil place. Christchurch, its capital, is like Peter Marisbeck in many respects. Ernest Rutherford, the scientist who first split the atom, was from the university here. The search for exhibits for Cape Town Science Centre led Michael Bruton to a small science centre here in Christchurch known as Science Alive. Signs Alive, which is based in a disused power station, is a small science center compared to the MTN Science Center. It's one of five science centers that were started in New Zealand eight years ago with lottery money. Of the five, only Signs Alive is still being run independently. The others have linked with traditional museums for commercial reasons. Signs Alive decided to become self-supporting. This meant they had to design and build their own exhibits. It's paid off, and over the years, their exhibits have evolved to handle the rigors of science center use. One of our fabricators said that there's five standards. There's domestic standard, industrial standard, commercial standard, military standard, and then science center standard. So they have to be built absolutely bomb-proof. Besides being strongly built, all of Science Alive's exhibits are designed to entertain both young and older visitors. One of the exhibits here at the Science Center explains how differences in air pressure can keep an aeroplane in the air. And using a simple beach ball, kids can understand this scientific principle. Believe it or not. Science Alive now supplies exhibits to science centers all over the world. Mike came here not only because of the tried and trusted exhibits, but also because New Zealand's currency was relatively stable against ours. 
the choice of exhibits available to him here was also wide. A number of the exhibits are designed to be transported, so schools rent them from time to time. Many volunteers offer their services to the center, so classes can be held in rooms especially set aside for the papers. Lectures on various scientific subjects are also open to visitors. I've got to hold it on fairly tight. So the, the, this stuff is starting to evaporate and it takes up more room. So you can see that a little bit of liquid nitrogen actually expands to a much greater extent than the liquid is. In the basement below Science Alive is the workshop. It is here that a team of experts led by a qualified aircraft engineer, Graham Christie, turned dull subjects into exciting ones. Good job. The challenge is um, making it so that the kids want to, to play with it or interact with it. And in doing so, they learn the principle that you're trying to, to convey to the kids. And also it should be intuitive so that without reading the instructions, they can come up and they basically know what to do. Science Alive learned long ago that kids don't like reading the instructions on exhibits. They lose interest and move on to another one. The exhibit has therefore failed as it won't teach the principal it's meant to. A lot of energy is put into monitoring the effectiveness of each of the exhibits on the floor. These were important considerations for Mike when he selected the exhibits for Cape Town. The most important criterion in selecting a display is its educational value and it must put across one simple message, either a scientific principle or a technological innovation, something that supports the curriculum in South Africa. Ocean Park Beach, Santa Monica, California. A place where the beautiful people are fit and the docks exhausted. Mike's search for the Science Center's exhibits led him here to a small studio near the beach known as the Geosphere Lab. The lab is run by Tom Vincent, an American artist of some note. Some years back, Tom collated thousands of Landsat photographs to create an image of the Earth from space that has gone on to become the top selling map in the world. It's an image that can't exist in reality. The Earth is completely cloud free and both hemispheres are in full summer. Tom's work with satellite imagery has now led to the development of the Geosphere, a two-meter diameter model of the Earth which has seemingly limitless applications. Only five geospheres have been built worldwide, and our visit to Tom's lab coincided with the final construction and testing of Cape Town's model. The clear acrylic sphere had to be first covered with the segments of the Earth photograph known as gauze. The gauze have to be stuck on the inside of the globe, and this is no easy task. But Tom and his team have found an accurate way of doing it using cutting guides. The internal projection system is then fitted into the globe, and the computer programming begins. Ocean currents are just one subject that can be studied using the globe. The purpose of geosphere is to be able to show the habitat of species and their migration patterns and, and their densities, say, 100 years ago and then today. And then we can overlay on that, say, a population database or an agricultural database, and then we'd be able to see where agriculture displaced uh, tropical forests. And, and display all the assets of the world visually on the globe. Programs will also be projected onto the globe to give viewers a unique learning experience. The geosphere offers us the opportunity to be out in space looking back at our planet. And I think what's significant if one looks at the space or, uh, research program, uh, much of the recent effort has been the so-called mission to planet Earth. We were using the space technology to look back on our planet, to monitor our impact and, and work out ways in which we can live sustainably. The Geosphere project also includes a computer program known as the Global Visual Library. And, um, 
there's uh, four main large icons which allow you to select through uh, different programs or different uh, visualizations, as we like to call them. In this visualization, the death of the RRC is covered in a series of satellite photographs. Badly planned irrigation projects killed what was once a thriving inland sea with an age-old fishing industry. We can also see migrations in ways not possible before. And fly southward toward their wintering grounds in the wetlands of the temperate zones. The distance. Uh, we have many visualizations: uh, mammals, reptiles, bird migrations. You name it, it's got it. Another interesting aspect of the Geosphere project, it is the uh, Live Earth program, which is a satellite picture of the Earth via the internet. As we speak, you can see the formation of the clouds. You can even take the clouds away for you to get a better picture. <laughs> Up-to-date weather reports are delivered at the click of a button. Also available are reports of volcanic and seismic activity and images from live webcams. Very escaped on 25 minutes to 9 at night. And the purpose of this really is to sensitize the present generation and future generations to the fragility of the planet on which we live. The Cape Town Science Centre will have many exciting displays for children and adults with inquiring minds. It will have four main themes through which threats of communication and technological innovations will run. We were invited along ahead of the Science Centre's official opening to look at these sections. The U and Society section has interactive displays designed to help children develop life skills. One of these displays is Building Africa, where children have the opportunity to build a house. By participating, they develop teamwork skills and improve their leadership qualities. Other displays in this area focus on maths and literacy. The U and Science section is designed to teach children about scientific discoveries and technological innovation. The displays in this area have been designed to explain how technology functions in a simple and fun way. Many of these displays are designed to be transported so that schools far from the Science Centre can also benefit. The U and the Future section prepares young people for a future that will be dominated by computers, the information highway and the internet. I see Gretchen and Wilbur. Underprivileged children will have the opportunity to use the Science Center's high-speed internet connections or learn about computers in the Center's computer school. But the major draw card to the Science Center could be the U and Your World section with the MTN Geosphere as its central feature. The exhibits and activities here are designed to promote an ethic of sustainable living based on an understanding of ecological processes and life support systems. It will give people in the Western Cape a view of their part of the world, such as they've never seen before. As a multidisciplinary facility, the Science Center also features a technology training school run by the non-governmental organization OTSTEP. The University of Stellenbosch also has an outreach program at the center. An auditorium will host larger presentations and theater. Science-based products will be available in the shop. On the roof of the Science Center is a camera obscura. Based on a design from the 4th century BC, it will give spectacular views of Cape Town and Robben Island. But the most important aspect of the Science Center is the educational opportunities it opens up for the Western Cape. All teachers will be able to use the Science Center as their own. South Africa needs scientists. We need mathematicians, we need scientists. And things like this is definitely going to be beneficial. Unlike traditional museums that focus on an unchanging past, Science Centers focus on the changing future. They empower and celebrate the human need to explore and experiment and make learning the fun and enriching experience it should be. With all this on offer, there's not much more an average person would need to stimulate interest in science. Once the Cape Town Centre is up and running, plans are to introduce similar ones in Durban and Johannesburg. Then everyone will have an excuse to learn about science and technology. Excuse me, I'm going to have to brush up my skills here.